As a chef, you know, you're always looking for inspiration in different areas, and we get a lot of inspiration from the produce that's brought in, uh, from culinary traditions, from culture, and to bring in literature as another source of inspiration is just one of those things that I think uh, reinvigorates the cooking process. Tables of Contents is a monthly culinary reading series and an occasional literary dinner series. There are a lot of different ways that we've been inspired for dishes. Um, it could be sort of an honest or meticulous recreation of a meal that's set in a book. And then sometimes the scenes won't have any food at all and we'll just be trying to capture a feeling or a description. And it's not always only about like this author mentioned chicken, but how does that page feel? Is it soft? Or are you gonna do then like a braised chicken dish? Does it have like a lot of action or excitement or like snap on the page? And then are you gonna do something crispy or fresh? All right. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Welcome to Tables of Contents reading series at Egg Restaurant. For first timers, this is a uh, loosely monthly reading series, an evening where we could have authors in the room and actually hear um, the readings occur and then taste something of what you just heard. While we are on the subject of simple classics, I suppose I should say something about roast chicken. Was there a cult of roast chicken in your day, Elizabeth? I don't see it in your pages. Perhaps it was still a luxury dish not easily set apart from all the other ones. But in our day, a whole cult of roast chicken has grown up, a literature in which roasting a chicken right becomes identical with acting virtuously. What we're bringing out is mashed potatoes with tarragon mustard paste and roasted chicken skin. He unfolded the wax paper, that snapping sound as it came flat, a sheep's head lay on the table. <coughs> Apollo audibly gagged. The old man laughed quietly and wagged a finger at Apollo. You can't be disgusted, he said. This is a tradition from my home country, and we must <laughs> never judge anyone's traditions. Be politically correct, or I will protest you. No judging, just acceptance. My grandmother now lives in Sable Palms, a hospital facility for residents who need round-the-clock nursing staff. She isn't allowed to drink anything because she might aspirate it, but she begs for water constantly in words often difficult to understand. In place of water, she's given lemon-flavored frozen suckers. As needed, an aide connects a saline pouch to a tube in her belly. She practices swallowing with pudding. Behind her bed hangs a photo, famous in my family, of her standing next to my grandfather on a beach, both of them in bathing suits. They're young and ecstatic to be together on the shore. My grandfather bears his teeth. She smiles a crooked smile into the sun. Take a spoon in the pudding. Sure. Lemon pudding. Oh, thank you. The hope for the whole existence of this mashup of food and writing is that each will sort of enhance the experience of the other. So it might just be normally a lemon pudding when you eat it, but after you hear Sarah read the passage, it's not just lemon pudding, it's the whole experience of loss and suffering and confusion. I picked a passage where food is kind of painted into the background and Evan very thoughtfully combined a couple of those mentions of food into a single dish. Well, I thought my dish was delicious. The chef did uh, just roast ch chicken crispy skin with a potato puree and an absolutely delicious uh, tarragon pesto. Oh, I'm a writer, so I'm a vain human being. I love the idea of a person being so inspired by a thing I wrote that they produce something that is infinitely more delicious than the thing I wrote. See, I think it's good. I mean, we can get people to eat sheep's head and listen to a very depressing passage on death and then eat lemon pudding. <laughs> um, I think it will have been an interesting eating experience for everyone.